So I am super excited to chat with Dr. Christine Smith as we are going to be discussing three types of injuries that can play a role in your autoimmune thyroid condition. So whether or not you have Graves disease or Hashimoto's or probably even a non-autoimmune thyroid condition, I'm sure you'll benefit from this, but especially if you have thyroid autoimmunity, uh, definitely want to tune in. So let me go ahead and dive into Dr. Christine's bio. So Dr. Christine Smith is a functional medicine practitioner and doctor of chiropractic with a background in cognitive neuroscience. She specializes in holistic injury recovery and optimization to help active people come back stronger, uncover hidden injuries, and prevent re-injury. She does this by teaching clients how to use recovery time as a gift to restructure lifestyle priorities and to become their own health authority through education rather than through medication. And thank you for joining us, Dr. Christine. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to chat with you about these injuries. And, you know, when talking about injuries, you know, I, I think a lot of people will think just physical injuries, but obviously this is going beyond that. And that's why you, that's why we talk about the three different types of injuries. So let's, before we talk about this, though, can you get a little bit more into your, your background, how you decided to focus on helping people with these uh, different injuries, biochemical injuries, physical injuries that what we're going to talk about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I feel like that's a deeper question than average because it kind of came through a journey of my own experience and of understanding the power of the mind and healing and the power of energy and kind of like understanding the frequency that your body is putting out. In chiropractic, we talk a lot about the tone of the nervous system. And it's, to me, I consider it like an instrument. Um, and that's how I talk to clients is it's kind of when I do body work, it's like tuning an instrument, trying to find harmony and make sure that there's no sharp points and flat points and bring everything back to harmony. And <clears throat> in understanding the mind-body connection, and that's how I got the specialization in cognitive neuroscience is I had my own experience where I dealt with a lot of stress and anxiety and my chemistry was just off and no one had talked to me about diet and lifestyle and all those things. And I was really confused and just following the conventional methods and it just was kind of getting worse. And I ended up seeing this body worker that did literally just like some touch therapy and kind of reset my nervous system. And after that, I just had this shift in my perception of the world because for the first time in 20 years, my system had exited fight or flight. And it was this whole new way of being and it changed you can almost feel it in your cells when something like that happens. And it's just this whole, it's like turning, it's like if you've been at a loud concert and you walk out and it's silent and all of a sudden you just have this shift. And I think understanding those things made me realize that there are different kinds of injuries. And then also in chiropractic philosophy, we talk about thoughts, traumas, and toxins. These are the things that stress your body and thoughts being like, are, you know, are just general stressful thoughts, except now it's really different than when we were being chased by tigers, because now that tiger is a bill or an exam or a work project or an upset partner or friend. And those things are ongoing and chronic and have uh, go over time. And so we have this big stressor over time that's coming from our own mind and it literally changes the chemistry of the body. So a divorce or like losing your home, that's a mental injury. And it creates a really similar cascade biochemically as to breaking your leg or tweaking your shoulder or hurting your low back at the gym. And there's those components. And then there's also a chemical component. So just all the toxins that we deal with in our environment and all the things that we can be exposed to, all of these add up to what's called allostatic load, which is like the overall capacity for your body. And if you have a bunch of mental stress going on, you're not gonna have as much capacity to get injured and heal quickly or to deal with a chemical exposure. Or if you just had a big chemical exposure, you're going to have like no emotional resiliency to deal with the stressors in your life. And that is how I kind of explain things to people and why I got into understanding things through injury. Because to me, if I can help people understand the cascade that happens in your body with a cellular injury, this is how we prevent disease. If we can catch it early and we can allow the cell time to heal and recover. Just like if you tweak your back at the gym, you're not going to go deadlift the next day. It's the concept of giving the body time to recover, but each of these injuries requires different kinds of recovery. And so depending on what's going on in your life, 
and which one is most prevalent for you, that tends to change my approach to care. And so that's how all of this kind of came into being was understanding how physiology works and then going through my own experiences in my life where trying to approach things from a single point of view just wasn't working. And we have to take into consideration all of these other modalities that exist and understand that all of our chemistry on a personal custom level is different and what's going on in our life is different. So you can have two people that just went through like the same intense mental stress experience at work, but one of them is also dealing with like a mold exposure at home and a different one also just like hurt their shoulder. They're going to have different responses to it and different capacity for dealing with it. Um, so I guess I think that's a good summary of an answer to that question, but let me know if I can expand. No, I think you did great. So obviously the shoulder injury would be an example of a physical injury. And then like the exposure to mold would be more of that cellular injury. And like it's similar. Injury. Exactly. Yeah. And same thing with like stress, other types of trauma as well. Yeah. So stress and trauma, I consider them mental injuries but it's happening on a biochemical level. All of these are happening on a biochemical level, but ultimately when we, okay. So if we really break it down, I'm going to get a little nerdy for a second. Um, when I was studying biology, I realized that to understand biology, I had to understand chemistry and to understand chemistry, you have to understand physics and to understand physics, you have to understand quantum physics, which leads you back to energy and frequency. So really everything is frequency and all of it comes down to that. And if you understand chemistry in the way that molecules and atoms work, they work with electrons in certain fields that are called valence shells. And depending on the organization of those um, energetic particles, that's how you get matter, or that's how you get sound waves, or that's how you get um, the visual light spectrum or you know anything tangible versus not tangible. And so energy and frequency is what makes up matter and the state of that matter. And so if we have thoughts, that's frequency and energy coming from our neurological system that's being turned into chemistry. If we have a physical injury, that is two pieces of matter interacting to change matter because of the force of the frequency that they interacted with. If we're dealing with chemistry, that is a certain chemical that is organized into a certain pattern that emits energy that affects other molecules. So this is why frequency medicine or things like meditation can affect a physical injury. And when you start diving into this world, you understand that our modalities of care are so far beyond a pill. And I think that's really important for people to understand because if you're just looking for a pill to fix your ill, it usually doesn't always work out the best because I will find when I'm working with people in care, if they've been through some kind of mental trauma, mental injury, and they're coming in with physical ailments, let's just go with like gut, right? Because gut's tied to everything. If I start giving them a bunch of nutrition and supplements and capsules, and they're still in a mentally injured state, their cells are in a cellular danger response. And they're almost like stiffer, like the membranes change when our cells are in that energetic frequency state of like a cellular danger protective response. And we can't absorb nutrition correctly because our nervous system isn't in the right state to send the correct signals to the cells to be able to absorb it and utilize it. So for that client, I start with physical body work to actually get their nervous system tuned and toned so that it's sending the right frequency signals to their cells so that they can absorb nutrition in order to heal. If I just give that patient nutrition, they kind of get better, but we usually hit a plateau. And so if I can get my clients working with their mental game and their mental stress, which I find is a huge component of pretty much any autoimmune condition, and it's very well dived into in the book, When the Body Says No by Gaber Mate. And it's this concept of that mental injury that's creating a chemical cascade can actually contribute to your autoimmune reaction because if your mental state is that you are in a state of defense against your environment or the universe, your immune system responds and goes, oh, I should be on defense too. And so if we can help people understand that, like, we have to address your mental state and bring you back to a state of feeling safe in your environment. 
And then we have to address your nutrition or, you know, your toxin component, what's floating around in your system. And then we can address the physical component of how all of those affect that. That I think is the key to healing. Awesome. Well, thanks for that explanation. So just to summarize those three different types of injury then. So there's the physical injury, there's the mental injury, and then the biochemical injury is not exactly the same as the mental injury. So those are the, the three different ones. Yeah, that's how I think of it and how I explain it to clients so that we can understand that we're always addressing the chemistry in our body, the mental output that's affecting the chemistry and the physical results or physical impact from the environment. And how does this relate to to inflammation because with inflammation you obviously if you have physical trauma you could get inflammation and you could if you want to talk about the difference between like acute and chronic inflammation and then with biochemical injury you also could get inflammation and i'm thinking also with mental injury you could also get inflammation if i'm wrong definitely correct me but if you could elaborate mm -hmm. on that as well you are so right um so it's kind of step two of everything we were just talking about, right? Everything we were just discussing is uh, the insult, the activity that instigates a response in your body. Inflammation is the response. Inflammation is a healthy response. Like we're supposed to have it. It's how our cells repair themselves and rebuild. Chronic inflammation is a dysfunctional response. And we can absolutely get this from a mental injury. So let's, let's just put in like a real life example, right? So let's say, that your dog passed away and then you went through like a breakup or a divorce and it's just kind of like it's all adding up right and you're just you're mentally stressed and then you get in a fender bender and you get that ugh, nasty whiplash and you're like oh i'm fine like whatever but now i'm dealing with this i'm dealing with my car i'm dealing with insurance i'm dealing with the divorce and then all of a sudden you get hit with some virus and now you're like kind of sick and dealing with it and, or even like a mold exposure in your home or whatever, you get some kind of environmental insult. So we've had the emotional, we've had the physical, and now we've had the chemical. And then all of a sudden your health just kind of like tanks and you don't understand what's going on. And you're just like, you're feeling bloated and you have brain fog and you can't sleep and you have headaches and you're feeling sluggish. And you're just like, what is wrong with me? And it's, you know, and this is happening over the course of time. And before that, you probably had some other stressors, like maybe you were in, school or you had like a huge project at work and it was just kind of like a thing that was on your system or you know you go through um societal stresses that have been happening over the last few years those accumulate into this as well and this is kind of how we hit that wall of our injuries and all of this comes back to inflammation because that's how our body responds to these so we have you know that original stressor of grief really is what those situations are. Grief is an emotional injury and that can come in a lot of different forms. When we have this emotional stressor, we put out an inflammation response. And in that inflammation response, part of what happens as just our normal immune response is that our tissues become more permeable. And this is how our immune cells move through the tissues to go repair the site that needs it <clears throat> or to respond with inflammation, healthy inflammation, acute inflammation. When this happens, we can also get some gut permeability. So let's say that we're really stressed out and now we're eating things that like maybe aren't totally great for us because they're comfort foods, but our gut's permeable and now it's accidentally like leaking through while it's also feeding our bad gut bacteria. The other part of an emotional injury that people often don't realize is that there are dysbiotic, gram negative, meaning like kind of they put out nasty chemicals, bacteria in our gut that feed and grow when your stress hormones are present. So they actually have receptors for things like cortisol. That's like your cinia and E. coli and stuff like that. So when you're stressed out, you actually grow bad bacteria in your gut and your gut's becoming leaky. And now maybe you're eating a bunch of gluten, which basically acts like a rake on the soft tissue of our gut and just creates holes and just kind of irritates the gut lining. And then this stuff starts leaking through and then it starts going into our bloodstream. And now we have what's called a subclinical level of endotoxemia, meaning we are accidentally poisoning ourselves on small amounts from the inside out. And then our immune system freaks out appropriately because it's like, oh my gosh, all this stuff is in the bloodstream. It's not supposed to be here. Let me take care of this. And now we have a hyperinflammation response. <clears throat> and in this, like our body's trying to take care of these things, but we get a secondary injury from the immune response. It's like 
when you have bad guys on the battlefield, you go take care of them, but the battle creates damage to the battlefield. So now our immune system responds by trying to clean up the battlefield. And it sends a whole bunch of like neutrophils and acute responders and all these things. And that's like part of our, what's called like the TH17 pathway. <clears throat> and all these responders come and they are trying to heal the area, but in doing so and still fighting off the bad guys, they're releasing all this chemistry to protect us that's accidentally creating more damage to the area. So now we get another immune response of more acute responders coming to the area to repair it while also accidentally damaging it at the same time. And we get stuck in this cycle of chronic inflammation where it's like our immune system is trying to repair us, but at the same time, it's accidentally damaging us in an effort to protect us from our essentially environmental exposures. And that is how we get stuck in a state of chronic inflammation. And if we can't move out of inflammation and into the stage of what's called proliferation, where I often call it like assimilation, meaning building stuff and repairing it, and then we move into remodeling, which is like testing it out and kind of stressing it in a good way and making sure the tissues are strong. If we can't enter into that stage, then we just stay in the inflammatory stage, which is essentially a breakdown state. And so whatever area this is happening in, that organ is going to start to break down. And this is why different people can have completely different responses to a very similar exposure. It's like, what's your Achilles heel? What are your genetics? Which I don't consider genetics fate. I consider them blueprints that we have tendencies towards. And then an environmental exposure will activate them, including stress. Stress will activate dormant genetics. And with these, this is how we get the outcome of whatever's happening to our body, which might be a thyroid condition, or it might be a gut condition, or it might be anxiety. Like I, when I have had my stresses and stuff, I had no idea it was coming from my gut. I had no gut symptoms. My gut symptoms showed up in my brain and your gut symptoms might show up in your thyroid and someone else's gut symptoms might show up in their liver and they have problems detoxing. And if you have genetics where you have problems detoxing, then if you have this environmental exposure, it's gonna be a much bigger burden on you than this person over here who has different detox genetics. And that's why like some people are super affected by mold and others aren't. And that is how inflammation plays into this whole game is it's like, it's a piece of every single one of them. And it depends on if our body can make it through a healthy injury cycle for that cell, or if that cell gets stuck in a state of inflammation and breakdown. All right, you gave a lot of good information there. So I, I like what you said about the absence of gut symptoms doesn't rule out a gut problem. So mm -hmm. that's because uh, I've come across many people over the years and, you know, no, no gas, no bloating, no pain, regular bowel movements. And still you, you, it is possible to have a leaky gut in that situation. So possible to have dysbiosis in that situation. Um, and then, yeah, you mentioned also, I had noticed a TH17, which is associated with autoimmunity. And then, so if someone's stuck in that chronic inflammatory cycle, that, definitely could set the stage for different autoimmune conditions, uh, not just Graves and Hashimoto's, but multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, and in the example you gave, a lot of practitioners might just focus on the gut if they realize that the person has a leaky gut, but if they're not addressing that mental injury, you know, the, you know, and you know, let alone the physical injury, because you gave an example where someone had, had all three but again, a lot of times as functional medicine practitioners, we're just focusing on that cellular component, that biochemical injury component. But as you mentioned, you really need to take a whole body approach. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, just in like a, a short way of saying it, like if your mind is in a state of feeling like it's under attack or, you know, another way of saying it is a victim mindset your cells are going to be in a danger response, which means that they're not going to be in a healing response. Like they kind of have to be in one or the other, like we, they can't really do it at the same time. So that is why getting your mental game corrected, I think is just as important as any medication because your brain is the most powerful drug you will ever have. And so when it comes to addressing that, when it comes to, you know, especially the mental injury, is it more than just blocking out time for mind body medicine? I mean, that I'm assuming at least is a component of that, but I, I listen like in preparation to this episode, I listened to some of your other interviews and you spoke about 
you know, meditation and meditation. I, I'm guilty of using it broadly too, but I heard you talk about like, how's it, there's different types of meditation. So I wanted you to also talk a little bit about that. So I guess it's like a two part question, just like what, you know, what do you do in general, you know, maybe besides meditation, but also if you could kind of elaborate on like your definition of what meditation is. Absolutely. That's a great question. Um, I think one of the easiest ways to define meditation that also identifies the purpose behind it, which I think people talk about like these different ways to do it and what it looks like, but it's time for your body to feel safe and enter a creative state and a building state and a repair state. But we have to make that time to feel safe. That can come in a variety of different forms. It can be a walking meditation. It can be a sport you like doing. It can be sitting on a cushion. It can be um, doing it in a group. Like it can come in a variety of forms and all of them have different benefits. So like if you're an angst, like a antsy person, you just, you're like, I cannot sit there for 15 minutes. Absolutely not. Like this is a waste of my life. Well, one, we should work on that perspective because it's self-care. You're basically going to the gym for your brain. And when you sit down and you have that anxiety, that is the point of meditation is facing it and sitting with it and realizing that it's not you. It is separate from you. It is usually the energy of society putting these burdens on you that make you think that self-care is a waste of your time. And if you can start to just sit there and be curious about it, then you start to see these like mental patterns that you get caught in. You're like, no wonder I'm stressed out all the time. I think that self-care for 15 minutes is a waste of my life okay, how can I shift my perspective on this? And when you start to become conscious of your own thinking patterns, then you can actually shift your perspective. And that perspective is what has to shift for you to feel safe. And you can really do this in like any environment. Um, like, you know, that's the whole idea of like Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for the Meaning of Life, I believe is the title. But he like, he wrote that from a concentration camp. And it's this whole book about the experience of, your perception in whatever you're in. And it's, there's a lot of different approaches to it, but one of my favorite ways, like I really love Joe Dispenza's work um, and he is leading the forefront on research in meditation and how you can literally change your entire gut microbiome in seven days as a novice meditator with no other changes in your life, just from meditation. It's pretty darn cool. And they're even showing that, you know, there's um, in the blood of advanced meditators, they produce proteins that prevent viruses from being able to enter cells. And like all of this research is being peer reviewed and like going through all the things to get published. It's like, it's pretty phenomenal research. And the idea is that when you go into meditation and you enter the state of safety, you completely change the chemistry that you're putting out. And maybe you're doing that on a walk, like walking meditation can be really powerful because then you're practicing this state with your eyes open in your active walking life. Cause you can go and like meditate for 20 minutes and feel really great in the morning. You're like, oh, this is so nice. And then you open your eyes and you immediately go back to your old patterns. And the rest of the day you're like in your stress state. Your meditation's not totally gonna matter. It's nice and it's like a little band-aid, but you have to practice it in your life. And that's the whole idea is it's like, just like you go get fit at the gym, it's so that you can do activities in your life. You don't get like super fit at the gym so you can sit on the couch. So we get fit in our mind so that we can apply it to our life. And when you realize that you are slipping back into your old patterns, that is when you kind of mentally, you know, like snap the rubber band on your wrist. And you're like, okay, wait, no, come back. Like, this is what I told myself I wanted to feel today, this morning. And you choose your emotions throughout the day. And that's kind of another component of what meditation is, is it's setting time aside to practice how you want to feel so that it's familiar to you so that you can activate those neural pathways through the rest of your day. And it's this choice of how you want to feel in your life. And I'll just, you know, the reason, and I had gotten into that work for many, many years, and then I kind of slipped out of it. And I think this happens to everybody, right? So it's this practice. It's a lifelong practice of coming back to yourself. That's another way that I describe it to people. It's simply coming back to you and who you choose that to be and shaking off the energy of everything else and everyone else and figuring out your own true core center. And sometimes when you really dive deep into it, you realize that you doesn't exist and that we're all just part of this like energetic field. And 
essentially little pieces of the universe experiencing itself. And that's when you kind of dive into the more like existential component of like that meaning for life. But the way that I really got into this is um, I was that person in my own form that we were talking about earlier, like huge emotional stressor, huge uh, societal stressor, and then a toxin exposure, and then someone going too hard on my gut with supplements, and my gut getting messed up. And then all of a sudden my health just shut down. And I didn't know about the mold exposure until later I found it. And I was like, oh, well, this would be the, the gasoline on the fire, which is usually what like an environmental exposure is. It's whatever fire is going on in your body, it just pours gas on that fire. And then it just explodes it all. And that's kind of what happened. And I became allergic to food and supplements. So I was a functional medicine practitioner that couldn't use supplements. <laughs> that was a very frustrating time. And in that, I was like, okay, what can I do? Because my brain also like wasn't working at that time. It was probably, I think the mental component of illness is something that isn't always discussed along with the concept of like an identity crisis when you're a very active person and then all of a sudden something shifts dramatically in your life and you can't do the things that make you feel like yourself. That in itself is a mental injury and needs to be talked about more in healthcare of like the identity crisis of illness. But in that, I was like, okay, well, what can I do? Because I can't exercise. I can't eat healthy food. Um, I like, I've, I've been to all the other routes. And so I turned to meditation and I went really, really deep into it. And I realized that I was in the mental state because of just like the accumulated effect of things that had happened. I was in a state of not trusting the universe. And I was in a state of defense on a mental game level, even though it was kind of subconscious. But when I took the time to sit with my subconscious and see my thought patterns that were coming up, I was able to realize the mental state that I was in and then work on it. And there's meditation where you're like very focused on a certain thing and you're kind of going inward and paying a really close attention to it. Like, you know, there's mindfulness where it's like you take a raisin and you feel every single indent of the raisin. And it's just taking time to be in peaceful presence with whatever you're doing. And then there's meditation like Dr. Joe Dispenza's work where I find it's very much an expansion and going outward. And it's like going so far outward with your energy that you forget that you as an individual exist. And you kind of connect with this greater field of energy in this place of complete peace. And when you enter that state of peace, and they're still coming to understand like how all this works, right? I don't know if we'll fully ever understand it. Like this is energy far beyond us that's really complex and what created us in the first place. And it's kind of just going back to that state of oneness and sitting there and almost charging yourself with this healthy frequency from the universe and letting that imbue all of the cells in your body so that they resonate at a healthier frequency. So that might've been a bit of a long, winded and complex answer, but this is why I love it so much is because when I finally realized that and I did this work, my immune system calmed down and I was able to eat food again and I was able to use supplements again. It took me a couple months, but nothing else had worked. And um, I had like, I was at the point where like I'd lost a bunch of weight, my hair was falling out, like it was not great. And um, that is what turned everything around for me and got me back to the point where I could use functional medicine to do, you know, the rest of the cleanup that I needed to do. Um, but I still find like, I still go in and out of my practice. You know, I, I try really hard to have a super good practice and it's amazing because I know how good it is for me. And I'll still find days where I resist it. And that resistance is my old patterns. And it's like, we can almost get addicted to our emotions of anxiety or whatever, because they're familiar and the unknown is scary, but that's the whole idea of meditation is it's like sitting in this unknown place and becoming comfortable with the unknown and not trying to predict anything in the future so that in your own life you can be comfortable without being in anxiety. So it's like if you fall out of your practice, you're probably being affected by your old patterns. And the number one thing you need to do is go back and sit with yourself so that you can figure out what's pulling you out and what you're trying to protect. And because that's really where they all come from. Like all of our patterns are just trying to protect us. So yeah, it's just time to go inward and feel safe and understand your own mind and your own patterns without the influence of anybody else. All right, well, thanks for sharing. And so that's really interesting. So usually when someone has food sensitivities, sensitivities to supplements is usually coming from the gut. And in your case, you really didn't focus on the gut, but you focused on the mental injury, which in turn helps with the gut, if I'm understanding correctly. 
that is definitely correct because I didn't have the option to focus on the gut. I couldn't. <laughs> and so that is where I gained like a whole other level of respect for it um, is just understanding the capacity of the mental state to heal the body. Like your body is amazing. And there's so many stories of people doing absolutely unreal things. Like there is a woman in one of the Joe Dispenza workshops who through meditation, and this is, this is a single case, but this happened, regrew her ablated thyroid proven by imaging. So like your body is capable of amazing stuff if you give it incredibly clear instructions, but you have to be very clear on what you want and you have to give instructions in energy, not words. Like your body doesn't understand words. So if you just sit there and you affirm all day, like I'm healthy, I'm healthy, I'm healthy, I'm healthy. That's not always going to work. Like you have to work with the subconscious mind and there's different tools for that because sometimes you need help. Um, like I do a modality called psych K with clients and it's a way that you can use neurological postures to basically imprint a subconscious belief in a way that your subconscious mind understands so that your body can respond because our subconscious mind is 95% of the mind. It's what runs the body. So if you're 5% up here saying like, I'm healthy, I'm healthy, I'm healthy, but you're not going in and feeling it energetically, your body's not going to respond to that. So I think energy and the feeling of it is the most important piece, which is hard and takes practice. And you said that was called Psych K? Yeah, so that's one of many modalities like that, but that one is called Psych K. Um, it's one that Bruce Lipton really likes. So if you know Bruce Lipton, he's another person mildly similar to Joe Dispenza who has um, a book called The Biology of Belief. And then uh, for anyone listening, Dr. Joe has a book called um, Becoming Supernatural. And both of those books would be great places to explore these concepts. Yeah, he actually has a number of different books. I didn't realize until I went on Audible because I listen to a lot of my, my books. And he has, I think, at least like four or five of them. Uh, yeah, Dr. Joe has four. I think he's working on another one. Um, and then Dr. Lipton also has a couple. Yeah. So testing. Do you do any testing in your practice? Before we chatted, before I press record, I think I heard you say that you either did AK or you still do like applied kinesiology. So I don't know if you still do a lot of muscle testing in your practice or if you actually do more functional medicine testing or a combination of both. All of the above, because why would I not use a tool that's present to me? Um, I love lab testing. I think it's incredibly important. I think it can miss things. Um, I think understanding your tools is probably the hardest part of being a functional medicine practitioner because there's so many out there. Um, I think there's a lot of trainings where people can go through and understand functional medicine concepts, which is really just lifestyle concepts. But if you don't understand physiology and you don't understand the labs and the supplements, then you're kind of at a loss. So there's a ton of different labs that I use and it depends on the case. Um, you know, ideally, like I'd love to see all the labs all the time, but you also have to do what's realistic for people. So depending on what comes up in a case, I will prioritize labs in a different order. I often, I also like actionable labs, right? Like there's a lot of labs that you can do that um, tell you what's wrong, but they don't tell you how to fix it. And so for me, I really like labs that show me like, well, what's going on with you nutritionally? Where, what is your nutritional level at? Um, I also really like things that show me like, what are your inflammation levels are like, what are they at? Which, you know, you can see on a classic blood lab with like CRP, and ESR, and I consider things like cholesterol and homocysteine also as inflammatory markers, which I think is a little non-traditional, but to me, it tells me that the system is off. And I consider homocysteine a much more important cardiovascular inflammation marker than cholesterol. If, I, if you have high cholesterol, it tells me your body's trying to repair something. My question is, what's it trying to repair? I need to go find that thing. And so with that, it's like, I prefer functional tests. So I'll run food sensitivity tests. And even though they change and there's arguments about them, to me, it's like, I want to know the number one immediate thing I can do that's essentially free for you to get your inflammation down, which is rather than me putting more supplements into your mouth, it is me helping you take poison out of your mouth. Um, the things that your body is reacting to poorly, which is not always something you'd expect. Sometimes it's foods you don't expect, like eggs. Like I love eggs. I think they're great. They have great nutritional quality. I find a lot of the time in inflammatory responses and in autoimmune people, they have a sensitivity to eggs along with gluten, dairy, sugar, the classic ones. 
But for me, it's like, I'll look and I'll see, well, what's the immediate thing that we can change in your life that'll start getting inflammation down when we make up the rest of our plan. I also love to run gut tests and not only like, cause there's labs that'll run like classic gut tests and look for, you know, infections that are, might kill you. And they'll like, make sure that you're not having some horrible infection. But I like to look at the subtle things where I'm like, okay, like, do you have any parasites that are lingering that we maybe need to take care of, which can get missed on those labs, which is where I also like muscle testing, which I'll come back to in a second. Um, but I also really like looking at the gut biome and like understanding the distribution of your gut bacteria and getting really specific on like what probiotics are right for you, or if your gut is even ready for a probiotic, which I think is a mistake people make. They'll think probiotics are the answer and they'll just take a bunch of them and then they'll wonder why they're bloated. And if you take probiotics too early before your gut lining is ready, you can actually cause more inflammation because people forget that they have inflammatory effects. They are a killing agent. That's how they work. They kill back bacteria and knock them out and take their place. So just understanding the order of operations of things, I think is where the labs can really come in is like, okay, well, how inflamed are you? Do I need to work on your gut lining first? Are you ready for a probiotic? That kind of thing. And then I'll run, um, you know, other labs like autoimmune or hormones or um, sometimes I'll look at neurotransmitters, but I find that's more tied back to gut. So it just depends on what's going on with the client. But I think functional lab testing is invaluable. And I just had a client the other day who is struggling with some cognitive decline and, you know, their neurologist, their first move is like, yeah, let's just put you on this Alzheimer's medication. I was like, can I run some functional tests first? Ran a toxin screen and a gut panel and he had an amoeba and high levels of lead and mycotoxins. So it's like, okay, let's work on getting these out of the system first, see if the cognition improves, and then you can decide what to do with the conventional route. Because he might not even need the medication. It might be that he has brain fog because he has a bunch of infections and lead that he's dealing with. So we're gonna address those first. So that's kind of an example. Muscle testing, I think is highly undervalued. And I know it's argued in different communities, which I understand because it is more of a subjective method, but really it's working with the electrical neurological system of the body. And it's a way to essentially ask the body questions simply by learning how to speak its language versus like lab testing is like translating the body's language into something that we can read versus muscle testing is translating our language into something that the body can read. And so it's essentially using a strong muscle as an indicator because your muscle should be able to be strong. Now, if you are like holding your arm out and someone's pushing down on it and then you step on it tack, all of a sudden you're like not going to be focused on your arm, you're going to be focused on the tack and the arm's going to go weak. And that's the concept of muscle testing in a really simplified way is like stress a piece of the body, see if the strength of the body changes. And this can be done in a number of different ways. You can do it really direct testing, which is like direct wiring testing. So if I have you put your shoulders out and I push down on your elbow while you turn your head to one side and all of a sudden that arm goes weak, it lets me know that your C5 nerve is disrupted and I should probably address that segment of your neck. And so that's like a really direct wiring way to look at it. Now, if we're doing it more with like nutrition and different things, if I have you put your arm out and it's strong, and then all of a sudden I kind of push upward on your stomach and it goes weak, that tells me that your stomach is actually kind of slid above your diaphragm a little bit and we might need to pull it down. And that's like the idea of a hiatal hernia, which I can't tell you how many hiatal hernias that are non-surgical that are people are like, I've had a reflux and GERD for 10 years and you pulled my stomach down and it's gone. <laughs> it's like nobody does visceral work anymore. And I don't understand why, like touching your organ, if you're trying to heal an organ, touch that organ, massage it, love it. Like it's the concept of where attention goes, energy flows and blood follows. So it's like give that organ love and attention with physical touch. And I think physical touch is something that's also been lost from care. So when you're working with someone and doing this, you're also like very close to them, you're physically present and that kind of energy, that kind of space holding also has its own healing component, I think. And so then you can get more complex and subtle with muscle testing where you can use it to essentially address energetic fields. So if you, you can use that indicator muscle and then you bring a supplement into someone's field or you can have them put it in their mouth and you see if that supplement weakens their body or strengthens it before they ever even have to swallow it, which is pretty cool. So for my really sensitive clients, I love this because it's a way to get very specific on like what supplements their body responds well to versus not instead of just like a guessing game of like, well, here, buy this, try this, see how it goes. We can actually get like specific that these things will be okay for their system. Um, and then you can even do it with mental thoughts, which is essentially how Psych K works. So if you bring up that mental thought that's a stressor to your system, your body is going to respond in a way that's weaker because it's a stressor to your system. And 
then you can go through and you can go through thinking patterns and subconscious thoughts and you can figure out which ones the body's strong to and which ones the body's weak to. And then you can figure out like what the actual thing that's stressing out their system is. And, you know, I was just working with a client the other day and she's working on fertility and we we're just helping her brain get on board with this. And we went through a couple statements of like, you know, my body is healthy enough to become pregnant. And it was strong to that. And then we finally got to, I'm not too old to become pregnant or like I'm young enough to become pregnant. And that's what her mind was weak to. So that's what we worked on. And if you can help the subconscious mind kind of get over these little hiccups that it has, then that's a component of healing for the body. So that's how you can kind of use it for like a physical ailment, chemical ailment or a mental ailment. But I think, and I won't even say ailment, just like a thing that you're working on, a stress point. Um, and that's where muscle testing is quite beautiful because when you mix it with lab testing, like labs, you know, we check every couple months because they're expensive. Muscle testing, we can check all the time throughout our appointment. And I also have a kit um, that I use and a variety of practitioners use different things like this and there's different approaches to it. Um, but the kit is vials that have been energetically imprinted with the resonance of certain enzymes in the body. So we can literally sit there and I can muscle test through an entire blood panel through a energetic bio kit in our office, which is great for when people are financially restricted. Um, and again, it's a subjective measure, which is why I love to back it up with labs, but it's pretty cool when you do muscle testing, you go through everything subjectively and then you run the lab and it's all the same stuff. So for the people that are skeptics out there, I understand because you know I come from a research background. I worked in many research labs and I'm all about data and numbers. And when I was learning this, <clears throat> I remember saying to a friend, I it's like, I don't feel ethical using something that I can't always fully explain to my client. And they go, well, I think if you have something that works and you're not using it because you can't explain it, that's unethical and you're depriving your client. It's like, ooh, touche, okay. And so with that, I just kind of became more open-minded and now I've just seen it work over and over and over and over again. And that's ultimately what made me go to chiropractic school instead of going to school to become a neurologist was because I worked in this conventional practice where, or sorry, um, integrative practice, where he was essentially using muscle testing components for functional medicine. And I watched people that had been sick for years get better in like three months. It's like, all right, I need to understand what you're doing. And then that's what led me into chiropractic school because he was a chiropractor. And, you know, chiropractic school doesn't always cover this stuff. That was stuff that I learned outside of it. But the concept in chiropractic school is the mental component that goes with all of this, which is the concept of vitalism instead of pathology. So our conventional model works in pathology, which is let me find what's wrong and shut it down versus chiropractic and muscle testing. And these kinds of concepts work more in the realm of vitalism, which is let me figure out what's right with your body and how to bring it out and how to support it. So I don't practice uh, applied kinesiology, but a number of years ago, I went to a conference and the, where they were pretty much teaching that. And the instructor said that when it comes to muscle testing supplements, it's a lot more accurate if you do put it in the mouth. So I just wanted to get your opinion because a lot of practitioners will just have their patients hold the bottle and then do the muscle testing um, just mm -hmm. probably because it's a lot more convenient and you're not using up supplements that way. But what, yeah, what's your thoughts on that? Sure. So in the very conventional or like the very traditional AK training, the concept is you should put the supplement in the mouth or like have it touching their skin in some way. Um, I have small vials that have supplements in them. And so then I'll have that person hold that vial. Um, sometimes we'll take the supplements out if I'm not getting a clear read. I have seen enough practitioners who are incredibly successful at helping people and what they do that don't put it in the mouth where it still works. And to me, that all comes back to the concept of the energetics and frequency and everything in the world has its own biofield, including that supplement in your hand. So you're testing the biofield essentially. And as long as it's not being blocked by some kind of material, I think you're usually in the realm of it working, um, but it's always you know, best and most accurate to put it in the mouth. So it's just, but both of them work. I've seen both of them work. All right, very cool. Well, I mean, you covered a lot of information here, but is there anything else that you'd like to chat about? Anything else I should have asked you that I didn't ask you? Sure. So I, you know, I love your audience and I love the thyroid. I think it's a really cool organ. And I know when you're going through a health issue, it's really easy to be angry at your body. And so if there's like one thing that I really wanted people to work on, it's this concept of seeing your body as your best friend that just got injured. 
Like if your best friend just twisted their ankle during a marathon, you wouldn't be mad at them for running slower. You'd be encouraging them and helping them and giving them water. <laughs> and so it's like, it's this idea of seeing your body as this friend that's going through a hard time. And all of a sudden your energy shifts from this, like being mad at your body from not working to like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry that you're going through this. How can I support you? And that energetic shift is how we start to create the biochemical shift. And the thyroid I find intriguing because I consider it the sentinel of the body. It's this very sensitive organ that's essentially like your fuel manager. And if something is off with your energy and off with your fuel, it's a check engine light. It's an indicator of like, go look at the rest of the body and see what might be irritating this very sensitive organ versus just throwing pills at that organ being like, okay, you're working now. It's like, we have to remove the irritant and the instigator, which is where it all comes back to gut and infection and environmental and mental stress and all this stuff. Cause you can have done all the things and all the detoxes and you're like, my house is completely free of any environmental toxin. I do everything cleanly, but you still live in this like mental state of just being really like judgmental and feeling under attack by everybody and resentful towards other people in your life. That's just as toxic as any cleaner or hormone disrupting BPA chemical, whatever. And so working with that component and understanding that your thyroid is this indicator. And that's where the deeper work can really start and where, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of retreats and like making time for yourself to go and like do a deep dive with yourself. It's really hard to do those deep dives in like our day to day lives. And so just picking some time for yourself at some point, even if it's like two days, just like go on like a yoga retreat or a health and wellness retreat or like an energetic deepening spiritual awareness retreat. Like there's tons of these that exist and just take some time to explore that side of yourself if you never have. Um, because yeah, that thyroid is very telling. And, you know, also like if you're working on your thyroid and you're doing all the medications and it's doing okay, but you're still like exhausted and you can't figure out why, check out your mitochondria. Like it's what the thyroid works on. The signal from the thyroid goes to the mitochondria for it to produce energy. So if the signal's going out, but the factory can't receive it and produce the outcome, then that's the thing that needs to be checked out. And just understanding that your body is this beautiful dynamic system and all of these little symptoms or things that you might be dealing with, they're just indicators. And that's how your body speaks to you. And starting to have this relationship with your body of like, you're talking to me, something's wrong. How can I love you? And shifting into that relationship instead of being mad at your body for its illness. I think that's the last thing I'd want people to make sure, want to make sure people got from this. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you again. And um, how can people find out more about you, Dr. Christine? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I provide a ton of free education online so they can go to my social media, which is just Dr. Christine Smith. Um, I have a YouTube as well, where there's a bunch of free education and that is just depth, D-E-P-T-H, like you have depth wellness. It's just YouTube at depth wellness. Depth wellness is also my practice. Um, and so if you want to just like learn more about services or um, explore any other things, because I try to provide things um, at every level for people. So it's like, if you just want some education, go check out those resources. Um, if you want to take like a little bit of a deeper dive, I have like some online courses and like guided meditations that I've created for my clients. And um, I uh, use those as packages for people. And because sometimes people just want the meditative component and that's all on my website. Or there's um, courses that I do, like online courses. I'll probably run another group course in February. And that one's like a five week course where I guide people through how to actually not only cleanse your body, but like cleanse your mind and cleanse your environment at the same time and understand the physiology behind how all this works and create a new relationship with your body. Not what I call reclaim vitality. So there's a variety of different options. And that website is just depthwellness.com, D-E-P-T-H wellness.com. And that'll have links to everything else that you could check out. So um, yeah, reach out anytime. All right. Wonderful. Well, uh, I mean, easy enough to to look that up, but I'll still include the links to the show notes and Perfect. appreciate you sharing that. And again, appreciate you taking the time to uh, discuss the different injuries. And uh, again, I learned a lot. I'm sure the listeners did as well. And uh, again, thank you. Well, thank you. And thanks for having your podcast. I think it's important for people to have resources to learn about themselves. <laughs>